Thanks, Jacob. Um, uh, and likewise, I'll have to, uh, you'll all have to forgive us. We're still sort of analyzing a lot of our work, as you might imagine, um, coming out of this past election. But I would like to, to share a couple of insights that we have so far. Um, I'll actually just put a few slides up on the screen um, if I can do that now. So. Are you guys seeing that now? Yep, yeah, thank you. Great, thanks, Jacob. So as, as you said, uh, BDI is a nonpartisan initiative focused on tracking and preventing political violence in the US. And we were largely created after seeing warning signs ahead of this last election specifically. Um, and this election cycle has been much of our focus these past months. Um, but our broader work um, is grounded in how these types of efforts definitely are ongoing and still deeply necessary. Um, so uh, a couple of the insights I'll share just over the past few months um, and the initiative sort of interventions that we focused on. Uh, there's one bucket that's about producing data for the broader mm -hmm. ecosystem. So part of what we worked on was finding funding and supporting a national um, public uh, uh, now self-sustaining project collecting real-time data on demonstrations and political violence in the US. Uh, we also use this data and our other work on civil society organizations to share online mapping tools that could be that could make this geographic data more accessible and attempt to connect it, not just the threats, um, but also local resources that could be involved in mitigating. Um, in taking kind of all of this available uh, information and resources, uh, we also did a lot of sort of community building and briefing. So um, briefing online and offline organizers on these emerging geographic specific threats ahead of the election, often in really high touch ways um, that help them dig into the specific of, of, of specific incidents that we were seeing in their state or community um, and supporting with other more academic modeling where possible. Um, and then uh, I'll give a couple of examples from these other uh, types of work that were really um, through the election cycle itself. So producing uh, daily and now weekly situation reports for trusted partners that incorporated online threat monitoring from folks like ISD, where we were able to really iterate and learn that the, geo the ability to connect geographic um, and actor-based details were important to a whole host of different stakeholders planning and responding uh, in their communities um, through this, the election cycle. Um, and there, uh, I'll give a couple examples going forward. And I think, uh, as we're looking forward, we also did connect some of this uh, to uh, uh, like nascent um, early warning and early response networks and mediators on the ground. So the, uh, the two examples I'll, I'll jump into here, um, one is kind of a steady state engagement example um, where we worked with a legal group at Georgetown um, who were focusing on preventing and even preparing to quickly address armed intimidation around the polls. So uh, we were talking to them weekly, pairing online monitoring from folks like the Atlantic Council um, with a lot of our incident-based um, uh, tracking. And that provided a feedback loop really to direct their community-specific outreach on legal tactics um, together with our analysis and then dig back in on specific incidents when necessary. Um, it also provided an opening for us to talk to the legal team about ways to incorporate more community groups um, and in turn, a lot of the resources they produced are what we used to provide in other briefings and other engagements to communities we were talking to about threats around the election um, and in a way that empowered action. So not just talking about threats of potential armed actors around the polls, but saying, what can you do about it and what are resources you can bring to bear? Uh, the other example I'd give uh, is more kind of around, uh, that was steady state, but this is sort of a, a, a rapid response to specific information. Um, so Jacob actually before this panel reminded me of a case in Detroit um, where ISD flagged a specific boogaloo threat. Um, and Jacob, I couldn't remember actually, this is a good example of sensitivity of information. Um, I found the, the brief, but couldn't remember if it was one we should share publicly here. Um, and what we did in that case was find a way to share it quickly with local actors. Um, and in a way that we knew the information wouldn't be uh, used to sow kind of concern necessarily, but would inform folks who would consider protesting and uh, incentivize safety around this particular incident. 
So it was going not just to community groups and um, local leaders, folks in the state legislature, um, but also to local law enforcement and doing so in a, in a quick way. Um, and we were able to do that in part because several months before, uh, we had already briefed sort of folks at the state level um, and had the community connections to provide that information quickly and immediately um, to the folks who could actually address it on the ground. So I think uh, one of the things I'll highlight in just sort of wrapping up about our lessons learned is that uh, much of this prior engagement is what's, what helped us then move to the rapid response and uh, like ability to address online threats um, when they were flagged by other researchers. So uh, just to quickly, I, uh, in, in, in preparing for today, I realized we had wrapped up some lessons learned in December. And as you might imagine, especially in the US, uh, we're continuing to reevaluate those lessons um, in light of everything that's happened in January. Uh, I think the, the reality is that much of what we know as researchers going into January 6 and beyond still holds very true. It's not a surprise um, to, to us, but we're still conceptualizing what opportunities and challenges that prevents, um, presents kind of going forward. I would say, uh, as you already heard, the things that really worked well um, through this election cycle were largely information sharing when we were able to combine a lot of different resources. Um, confirming and checking online flags with offline data um, and that emerging feedback loop uh, that I had talked about, as well as um, joint and collaborative briefings from different types of uh, researchers and different types of information. Um, the places where I think we still have ability to kind of grow in the US for sure um, it are some of the different efforts to do more auto coding of hate incidents or protest events. A lot of what we were doing with uh, real world harm is still lagging. We'd like it to be faster, but the ability to sort of bring algorithmic, algorithmic methods to that that are really usable by the community, uh, we still like kind of have a ways to go. Um, we also talked about some platforms for researchers that I think could still grow. Um, and I would say sort of finally too, our initiative really started with this work, like how do we push this information and data to local communities and keep it at the core um, and that's something that we can need to continue to do. So um, we have a lot of online tools, but to continue evaluating what's the uptake, how can we make them more usable um, going forward? So looking forward to the discussion. Thanks.